All right, in this video, what I want to show is actually go through the steps of how you do hypothesis testing when you have dependent data. So as you might remember from the last video, we introduced what I called example one here, which given this data here on number of books read by males and females, and in this case, the two lists, the males and females were connected in the sense that this person is married to this person. So don't think about this as 20 unrelated observations, 10 of them in this column and 10 in this column. Think about them instead as 10 different sets of two. Right? Here's a married couple here, here's a married couple here, and so on. So I randomly select 10 heterosexual married couples. Uh, maybe I should even write and record number of books. Read by husband and wife in each couple. So that's what we're gonna pretend this data is right here. And maybe I'll ask a question like, can I conclude with, what should we say, let's do 90% this time, because why not? Certainty that males read more than females. All right, well, here's the key point here. If these lists are connected, right, again, this person is married to this person, then it makes sense to subtract the two columns. All right, we don't have a way yet to deal with two different sets of data, but we're really good as long as we only have one set of data, one sample of data. We've been doing that all class. Well, if these data sets are connected, if this is dependent data, then I can just subtract the two. Right? Instead of thinking about this as 10 observations and 10 observations, two different sets of 10 observations, I can turn it into just one set of 10 observations by doing subtraction. Three minus four is negative one. This negative one represents in the first couple, the male read one less book than the female. In the second couple, the male read, what, three less books it looks like than the female. Six minus five is one. So in this couple, the male read one more book than the female. Eight minus eight is zero. They read the same amount. 10 minus nine is one. 12 minus 14 is negative two. 15 minus 10 is five. 20 minus 16 is four. 24 minus 18 is six. And 30 minus 22 is eight. What I can do if and only if I have dependent data is I can change two different lists of data into just one list of data. And the advantage of doing so is then I can just test that one list of data. So all I'm gonna do if I have dependent data is this subtraction idea and then test that one list. And it turns out you can do confidence intervals as well, but this time I'm gonna do hypothesis testing first and confidence intervals in the next video because I think hypothesis testing is a little bit more intuitive. At any rate, let's actually do it. Um, I guess the first step would be to enter this data into a list. So you pull out your calculator, you hit stat and edit and pull up your list so that you can enter some data. I'm gonna clear them out. You might wonder, should I enter all three lists of data? Well, if you have dependent data, you only need this. So if you want, you can just enter this. However, in my next example, I'm gonna do this with independent data, in which case I will need the data in blue. So to save myself some time, I'm gonna type in all the observations in blue, and then I'm gonna show you how you can get the observations in green, how you can get your calculator to do the subtraction for you. And then in list one, two, and three, I'll have all three of these so that I can, not, I can do not only this example, but also the next one that I do. So if you wanna follow along in a calculator, type these into list one and these into list two. I'm gonna do that now. The magic of pause, I now have those all entered into list one and two. Note that I haven't typed the numbers in green in yet. In this case, the subtraction was easy enough that you could just do the subtraction on your own and type in the numbers in green. But I wanted to show you how you can do that in your calculator as well. So right now, as you can see, this first line under list three is highlighted. My calculator is asking me for the first observation in L3. That's what this one means. Instead of telling it the first observation, what I want to do is I want to program L3 directly. So if I hit up, now what it's asking me is what do you want L3 to be? And what I want L3 to be is L1 minus L2. I want it to be males minus females here in order to get all these numbers. So I could just tell my calculator that. I could tell my calculator I want L1, so second and then one. Now it says list three equals L1 minus L2. And what that will do is it'll create a whole new list. Once I hit enter, it's gonna populate all the observations in here. 
with just the difference in the two lists. I hit enter and there they are. And maybe to check that I typed everything in right, negative one, negative three, one, zero, one, negative two, five, make sure I get a four, six, and an eight. Looks like I do. Cool, now I got L3. So that's a little trick for how you can get your calculator to do this subtraction of the list for you. What I now have is data in L1, L2, and L3. For this example, I'll only use L3, but I'm not gonna erase L1 and L2 because I'll use that for my next example. At any rate, hypothesis testing. Uh, what we're doing with hypothesis testing, first, your first step has always been state the Nolan alternative hypotheses. There's some similarities to how we've been doing this in the past, but you'll see it's a little bit different. So we still, H0 is the symbol we use for the null, and H1 or HA is the symbol for the alternative, and we're still putting these colons in here. And then what you want, in words, what your null hypothesis would be, maybe it's easier to start with the alternative. What the alternative would be is, let's see, that males read more than females. And what your null hypothesis would be, what the skeptical point of view would be, no, nah, males don't read more than females, they read the same amount. So in words, I want to say males read more than females, and I want to say males read the same amount of female, as females. That's the ideas I want to get across, but I want to do that with the symbols that we've learned. So how can you do that up here? Well, think about what happens to these numbers when the male observation is greater than the female observation. So down here, for example, when the male is greater than the female, well, then when I subtract the two, I'm going to get a positive number over here in the difference column. Contrast that with up here, where the female read more than the male. If the female is more than the male, then when I subtract them, I'm going to get a negative number. Equivalent to males read more than females is the difference is greater than zero. Right? A difference less than zero means female read more than male. A difference greater than zero means male read more than female. And if the difference is exactly zero, that means the male read the same amount as the female. I want to state my null and alternative hypotheses in terms of the differences here because when I have dependent data, it's the differences that I'm testing. So what I want to say for my claim is I want to say males read more than females. And the way I'll write that is mu of the differences. Typically, that's a mu with a little d in the subscript. If you want, you can write mu in the word differences down here. Either way is fine. Mu of the differences is greater than zero. Why greater than zero? Because again, positive numbers over here correspond with values on the male column greater than values in the female column. And values in the male column greater than values in the female column is exactly what my claim was. Males read more than females. The null hypothesis would be they read the same amount. If they read the same amount, the differences are zero. Mu of the differences equals zero. Man, that felt a lot harder than the null and alternative we've been doing. Yeah, I guess it is, but maybe I can give you some shortcuts. So in the past, when we did alternative and null hypotheses with means, it was always in 5.1, for example, the most recent time we did it. We always compared mu and mu naught. But there is, mu not, there is no mu naught because mu naught was kind of the baseline population average that we compared things with. And we don't have that when we have two different samples. So kind of taking the place of mu naught will always be the number zero. Instead of comparing mu and mu naught, you're going to compare mu of the differences and the number zero. It will always be a symbol, mu of the differences, and a number, zero, which is the same as it's been. It's just the number you don't have to look for in the problem. It'll always be the number zero. And technically, the symbol should have a little d for the differences down here. In the past, the null hypothesis always had an equal sign in between those two things. It still does. That'll always be an equal sign. In the past, there was always either a greater than, a less than, or a does not equal sign in here. And you had to figure it out. And if it was a greater than sign like it is here, you'd have what's called a right-tailed test. All that is still consistent. It's just a little bit harder to figure out that it's greater than, less than, or does not equals. We'll talk more about that later. You might be like, oh, yeah, 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 I knew it was greater than because you said more than here. Yes, that's true, but you have to be really careful. Because if I said, can I conclude with 90% certainty that females read less than males, that's the exact same as males read more than females. Females less than males, males more than females, that's the same. But one says more than and one says less than, so that might get kind of confusing. What I'm going to do to try not to confuse you is I'm always going to state the claims for the first group relative to the second group. So males read more than females. I'd give you the males first and then the females second so that you can always do the subtraction list one minus list two. And then words like more than and less than will make sense when you see greater than and less than signs. But the point is just, if you did your subtraction different, if you did females minus males, this would be positive one, this would be positive three, this would be negative one, 
And now all of a sudden, if this column is females minus males, a claim of males read more than females would be a left-tailed claim. You'd need a less than sign in there. If you do the subtraction in a, I don't know, counterintuitive way, it messes up your alternative hypothesis. Okay, you're really confused right now. Don't worry about it a whole lot. I'm gonna to try to ask it in the easiest way possible, and I'm gonna show you a trick that'll help you identify if you ever flip this inequality around. If it's a does not equal sign, it's pretty easy. Can I conclude with 90% certainty that uh, males read a different amount than females? It doesn't matter. If you put does not equals, you don't have to worry about which order you did the subtraction in. But if you have a one-tailed test, left-tailed or right-tailed, sometimes this can get flipped around because you might do your subtraction weird, and I know you don't quite follow that right now, but there's a check at the end. And I'll show you the check at the end. I'll show you what will happen if you had that flipped. So it's not that big of a deal. Two, shape, center, and spread. Short answer and long answer. For shape, center, and spread, which we've been doing, I'm going to tell you you can just skip it. You don't have to worry about shape, center, and spread of the distribution. You could figure it out, but they're going to get pretty complicated in the coming sections. They're going to turn into really ugly formulas and stuff that I don't want you to have to do. So I believe that you could look up the formulas. They're not ugly formulas yet, but this just seems like a logical place to cut off shape, center, and spread. So you don't have to worry about shape, center, spread. It's going to turn out that the shape is approximately normal because I'll put in some assumption in here. I'll say, suppose that the number of books that... Uh, Suppose that the differences are approximately normal or something. I'll give you that the shape is approximately normal, or I'll give you a sample size that is so large that the central limit theorem makes it normal. I'm going to make this work out to be normal so you don't have to worry about it. The center will end up always being equal to zero, and that's kind of the logic that we assume the null hypothesis is true, but you don't have to worry about that. The spread is just the standard deviation of the differences here. All stuff that you won't have to worry about. So short answer, shape, center, spread, you can ignore it in this section. Three, I'm gonna ask you to draw the picture. Which picture, the p-value picture or the classical picture? Only the p-value picture. And the reason why is because if you were doing the classical picture, you'd need to know your critical value. And this is gonna end up being a t distribution, not a z distribution, because there's no note of sigma in here. Nobody told me any population standard deviation. So because it's a t distribution, if, it, if there were critical values, I'd have to figure them out with the inverse t calculator function. And not everybody has an inverse t calculator function. So you'll always just be doing the p-value picture when you're doing hypothesis testing. When you're drawing your picture, you always put zero in the middle. And that's because these are normalized values. We've always been putting zero in the middle, true. However, in this case, this zero represents a z-score of zero zero spreads above the center, but the center itself is also zero because of this zero up here. You don't have to worry about it. When you draw your picture, put a zero in the middle just like you've been doing. Uh, next step was to go to my calculator and get my test statistic and my p-value. Yeah, but what calculator function do I use? Turns out you're gonna use one that you've used before. You're just gonna go over to tests and you're gonna select t-test. Why t-test? Because I only have one set of data. Because I was able to do this subtraction, I only have one set of data here. And as we saw in the previous video, when you only have one set of data, you can do your hypothesis testing with either a t-test or a z-test based on whether or not you know sigma, the population standard deviation. The only standard deviation I can get is out of my calculator. It's a sample standard deviation of this data. So I'll never have a population standard deviation. Nowhere in here did it say, you somehow know that the standard deviation of the number of books uh, more that males read than females is, is something I don't even know how I'd word it in English. That'll never happen. This will always be a t-test. Hit enter. As we saw in the previous section, you can do t-tests whether you have data or statistics. So I could give you statistics rather than actually detail this data here. I could say you went out and grabbed 10 males and or 10 married couples and recorded the males and the females, and then you took the male numbers and subtracted the females and found that the average dis difference was 2.2, and the standard deviation of the differences was 1.8. And I could tell you X bar and S, and you would say there's 10 married couples. I could give you all the statistics, but typically what I do is I give you the data itself. And you're like, all right, the data. If I have the data, all my calculator needs is mu naught. Well, what would mu naught be? Mu naught is just the zero that you put right here. There is no mu naught in this problem. You'll tell your calculator zero to make the null and alternative hypotheses work out. 
And then it'll ask you, okay, what about where's my sample data? Where do I find that all? I remember I put this in L1 and this in L2 and this in L3. Don't have to tell my calculator all that stuff. No, just tell your calculator L3 because all we're doing is testing the differences because we have dependent data. This will only work if we have dependent data. So I'm going to tell my calculator my data is in L3 by hitting second and then three. Frequency is something we always ignore in our class. And then my alternative hypothesis was that mu of the differences was greater than zero. So this mu represents mu of the differences. And then mu naught, I told my calculator, is zero. So mu of the differences is greater than zero corresponds with mu greater than mu naught. And then you can either calculate or draw. Since it's p-value, I typically choose draw. It's going to draw me this picture over here. And it's going to shade in an area to the right. Give me a test statistic. In this case, that test statistic is 1.6393. I'll indicate that with a T because this is a T test. And then I'll shade the area to the right here. And that will be my p-value. And in this case, the p-value is 6.78%. So what did I make this a 90% certainty? So alpha is 10% in this case. So it looks like my p-value was less than alpha. So when I state my conclusion, I will say because my p-value, which was 6.78% is less than alpha, because alpha was 10%. When my p-value is less than alpha, there is sufficient evidence to reject the null. That says my claim is true. There is sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that males read more than females. If you're really nitpicky or, I don't know, kind of impressively informed on this topic, you might know that my sample, my sample is really just including married males and females. So maybe I should say that married males read more than married females or something. Uh, but I'm not going to worry about all that. The point is just, can you make your conclusion? And since I said in the claim here, males read more than females, well, we can just repeat that down here. One last comment. I talked about how this can be kind of confusing, putting this greater than sign in here. Like maybe you did the subtraction in the wrong order, or maybe you just got confused and put a less than sign here. Let me show you how you can recognize that that might have happened. When we went to tests and t-tests, if we had gotten this wrong, if we put a less than sign and then instead of a greater than sign, what will end up happening is it won't change my test statistic at all, but it will shade to the left of my test statistic as opposed to the right of my test statistic. So what will happen is most of my distribution will get shaded in. If you see a p-value greater than 50% in a one-tailed test, go back and double check this and make sure that you have this sign right. And if this is in our class, just flip this around. I promise you, you have it backwards. That is how you can do hypothesis testing when you have dependent data um, and note that you could do the same thing if you had the statistics instead of the data itself what i'll do in the next video is show you how to make a confidence interval with this data and then we'll go back and do it all with independent data